All right. Okay, so last time in class we talked about um, uh, charge distributions and we talked about Coulomb's law. And today what we're going to do is we are going to find, um, actually we use Coulomb's law on discrete charges. So what happens, how do you calculate the electric field when you have a single point charge? What, how do you calculate the electric field when you have multiple point charges? Today what we're going to do is we're going to calculate electric fields when you have charge distributions. All right. Uh, does anyone recall what is a charge distribution? What's the difference between a discrete charge and a charge distribution? Single point, multiple single points. Multiple single points, right. And then what's a charge distribution? Assuming it's continuous. Exactly. That's right. That's exactly that's right. Charge distribution is continuous, right? We're going to be looking at examples of that. And uh, there are two ways that we can find the electric field from charge distributions. One is to apply a version of Coulomb's law where you do integration. And then the other way is called Gauss's law. We're going to be talking about both of those methods today. And that's going to be the majority of the class today. If we have a little bit of time at the end, we might start talking about electric potential and what those concepts are. But for the most part, we're going to talk, maybe be talking about electric fields. So a lot of problem solving today. Um, and we'll get right to it. So, uh, you know, we've been talking about uh, the electric force. Uh, we talked about charge density distribution. And the first type of problem we did was how do we calculate uh, total charge, Q. So today we're going to be using charge, dens charge density distributions and we're going to be calculating the electric field. All right, so just moving ahead here. Uh, really quickly from last time in class, what we did, we did examples of Coulomb's law. Uh, we started with Coulomb's law. We said, what happens if you have uh, two point charges? What is the force between them? Okay, and then we talked about a general form of Coulomb's law where we said, okay, um, how do you find the electric field at a certain distance away from an arbitrary uh, charge, a, a charge at an arbitrary point in space? And so we did an example problem there where we figured out um, the electric field intensity at a point P, <coughs> negative 0.2, 0, negative 2.3, um, due to a point charge of 5 nanocoulombs, sorry, due to a point, a point charge of 5 nanocoulombs at a different point in space. So there's an observation point P, and then there's a location where the charge is located. And the reason I'm mentioning this again today is because it's going to be very important in what we talk about today. So we calculate the electric field intensity at the observation point P due to the charge located at a different point Q. Okay, we talked about a strategy on how to solve that problem. Um, and uh, we extended that into the situation where you have multiple point charges. So in this example, you had um, an observation point P, and there's two charges. There's a Q1 and Q2. So you basically have to do the, uh, the Coulomb's law problem twice, once for Q1 and another time for Q2. And then you find electric field contributions for each one of the charges. And then to find the total electric field, you have to add up those contributions. OK. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be talking about electric fields in charge distributions where you not just have like, you know, one, two, or three, or four charges, or so on, discrete number of charges, we have a continuous uh, charge distribution. And so to, to solve for the electric field, now we need to use integrals to find the total electric field. All right, um, as we talked about uh, yesterday, or on Monday, there are two types of charge distributions. There's a volumetric charge distribution, a surface charge distribution, and a linear charge distribution. Okay, um, so as you can see here, just rem remind ourselves of what the units are for each one of these charge distributions because that'll give you a hint on what type of charge distribution problem you have. So if I give you rho v or I tell you that the volumetric charge density or I tell you that the units are coulombs per <coughs> meter cubed, you know you're dealing with volumetric charge density. Okay, volumetric charge density is where you have charges in a three-dimensional space and you have some kind of function uh, that tells you what that charge distribution is within that three-dimensional space. So rho v could be, it could be fixed, which means you have the same charge density everywhere in that volume, or rho v could actually be a function of x, y, and z, or depending on whatever coordinate system you're in. It could vary as a function of location. 
in the three-dimensional space, okay? Um, so what defines a volumetric charge density is the units coulombs per meter cubed. You can also have surface charge densities where, is, where I may tell you, okay, you have a surface charge density in coulombs per meter squared, and um, in, in that case, you have to do an, in, uh, an integration over uh, two dimensions instead of three dimensions. To, uh, and in the case of a linear charge density, you may have a distribution of charges along a length, and the units for that is rho L. It, units for rho L is coulombs per meter. All right, so what you're seeing on this slide is a form of Coulomb's law. DE is equal to A sub R rho over four pi epsilon R squared. Okay. Now, let's just back up for a second here and look at this form of Coulomb's law, okay? The discrete form of Coulomb's law, you, you notice that you have this Q over four pi epsilon. And if we look at this other form here, this looks even more similar to with the formula that we just saw, okay? Um, so Coulomb's law says that the electric field at a point at an observation point P is equal to Q over four pi epsilon. Q is the amount of charge that you have at this point Q. Uh, R2 minus R1 is the distance between P and Q. It's the distance between the observation point and the charge, and that is squared, okay? So what you have here is the distance between the two points squared. You have Q, the amount of charge, and then you have this four pi epsilon factor. And then you also have a direction. The direction is AQP. And what AQP means is if you draw a vector between P and Q, okay, you draw, draw a vector between, connecting P and Q, um, this is the unit vector going from P to Q. All right, so this form of Coulomb's law, you're gonna notice looks very similar to this, um, the differential form of Coulomb's law. Let's just zoom in on that. Okay. <coughs> So instead of Q in the numerator, we have rho. Rho is the charge density, and that could be a volumetric, surface, or linear charge density. We still have the four pi epsilon in the denominator here. And we still have R squared. R is the distance between the observation point and the charge that you're looking at. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a second. And then you still have this A, um, a hat sub R, which basically means the um, if you draw a vector from the charge that you're looking at to the point of interest, and you take the unit vector, that is your a sub r. So really, this is just a redefinition of Coulomb's law in, um, in a differential format. So we're gonna be looking at um, how to actually solve problems like this. So this is the general form here. The differential electric field is equal to, uh, e equal to this quantity here. But in order to find the total electric field, we have to integrate over this charge density. All right, so in the case of a volumetric charge density, we'll zoom in here. In the case of the volumetric charge density, we have to integrate over the volume. So this rho over four pi epsilon r squared, this rho becomes a rho v, a volumetric charge density. Your four pi epsilon is the same as before. You still have your a sub r and you still have your r squared. But notice that some of the things come outside of the integral and some of the stuff remains inside the integral. Why is that? Well, um, as I mentioned before, rho v, well, the short answer to the question is all of these things can vary as a function of what point in space you're at. You're integrating, you're doing a triple integral over a three-dimensional space. So the stuff that goes outside the integral are all the constants, the things that do not change as a function of location in space. These things on the right, however, the things within the integral, all of those things can change as a function of position, a 3D position. All right, so rho v might change. It could be a function of x, y, z. The r will change depending on what the, we're gonna be integrating, we're gonna be looking at every single observation point in this space. Well, I'll, I'll get into the details of that. You'll, you'll, see, the, you'll see how that works. Um, and then you have a sub r, which is the, uh, the vector going from the charge to the observation point. 
and then you have dv. You have to integrate all of these. So this, these will become clear once we start doing some example problems. We'll be doing a couple in class, and then you'll, you'll be assigned some as homework. All right, when you do a surface charge density, notice that the rho becomes a rho sub s, and you are integrating in two dimensions with respect to s instead of with three dimensions with respect to v here. So you have a surface charge density, and you're going to be integrating that over um, two dimensions. And then finally, the simplest case is a linear charge density where you, you just do a single integral of rho L over, uh, over a line in space. All right, so you know uh, the best way to do these th types of things is to actually do an example problem. And uh, we can start with the electric field around an infinite wire. Um, so as I said before, these types of problems are often the most, um, the most tricky uh, types of problems um, in, that we'll be doing in this class because there's a, lot, um, there's a lot involved in it. Okay, So let's go through uh, each one of these examples uh, in turn. Uh, we'll, we'll just go through step by step. Okay, So the first problem that we're given here is that determine the electric field intensity of, I should say, forget of, the electric field intensity at a distance r from an infinitely long straight li uh, line of charge <coughs> with uniform density rho l equals coulombs, uh, rho, rho l, uh, and the units for that is coulombs per meter. All right, so I've listed out a seven-step strategy to solve this problem, okay? Um, so that we think through each one of the steps. We break down a complex problem into a, into a series of smaller parts that we can, um, hopefully each one of these individual steps will be more simple than thinking about the, the thing as a whole. Um, and this is a strategy that I suggest that you have for, regardless of what kind of engineering class you're doing, is to break a complex problem up into smaller parts, into manageable steps, and then um, do each one of those steps uh, carefully and make sure you understand the concept in each one. All right, so some of these st steps in the strategy are going to appear very um, menial or very, like, you know, too simple. Does that even need to be considered a separate step? I'm saying, I'm putting it out explicitly because I want you all to think very carefully about uh, each one of these steps, okay? All right, so um, the problem looks like this. As stated, you have an infinitely long wire, and just imagine that you have charge densities all along that wire, okay? And we are at an observation point, our observation point P. I'm just redrawing this a little bit, but just imagine that the observation point P is at a distance R away from the wire. Okay, so this is our mm -hmm. geometry. Observation point P, we have this, instead of having a single charge, now we have an entire line of charge. So how do we deal with that? Okay, we have to do an integration. Now really quickly, like before we start, what we're essentially gonna do is we are gonna look at, uh, we're gonna start by looking at this point here, then we're gonna start looking at this point here, then we're gonna start looking at this point here, and then this point here. And every single point, there's a charge, okay? And for every single charge, we are going to figure out the electric field at point P due to that charge. And we're gonna, we're gonna integrate that all along the, the length of the line. Okay, that's, that's the overall strategy for doing this problem. And now we're gonna go through the individual steps. Okay, the first thing to do is we have to decide, this is a very um, trivial portion of it, but always go through these steps in terms of thinking about it. So the strategy here is that we have, uh, we have to ask ourselves, do we have a volume, a surface, or a line charge? So let's start with that question. Okay, we have a line charge, and the reason why is because we're given rho L, and the units are coulombs per meter. And just looking at the geometry, we can see that, you know, it's just a, a line of charge. So we are just going to say, okay, great, we have line charge here. Line charge means we are going to do a one-dimensional integration. 
If we have a surface charge, we do 2D. If we have a volume, we do 3D. The second question is, what is the coordinate system? So we can um, we we can actually use uh, uh, um, there's many different there's different coordinate systems that could work in this problem. Spherical. Uh, spherical is the one that I would actually want to avoid in this problem. So I agree, Cartesian coordinate system would work fine here. You could also use a cylindrical coordinate system. And both of them are going to be very similar in this problem, you'll see. So the solution that I'm going to give you is in the cylindrical coordinate system. Okay, um, but, but, but it's really like, you know, it, it, it should be fine in any um, in Cartesian as well, the way that we're going to solve this particular problem. Okay, so the reason Cartesian is valid is because we see like, okay, we have, um, we have an observation point P and we just have a long line of charge. Okay, notice that this problem is not asking us, it's not asking us to calculate the electric field going around in a circle like this. Okay, if it was going around in a circle like that, we would have to use the cylindrical coordinate system, right? But in this case, we just have a, a line of charge along the z-axis, and we have an observation point P out here. So the z-axis in the Cartesian coordinate system and the cylindrical coordinate system are equivalent, right? The z-axis in, in those two coordinate systems are the same, the, the uh, Cartesian and, and uh, cylindrical. So you know, we can use either one. So um, it can be Cartesian or um, cylindrical, but we're just going to be using the cylindrical coordinate system here. All right, so step three, we have to find a sub r, r, and a sub r hat. So let's remind ourselves what those are. Okay, so we are going to be finding the, the differential electric field. And so within there, we have... Um, a sub r hat. So to calculate a sub r hat, we have to first calculate a sub r. Then we calculate the magnitude of a sub r, and then we, which the magnitude of a sub r is basically r, it's r here. And then we we can calculate a sub r hat. Okay. So the first thing we do is we calculate those, and then we calculate d sub e, or d e, the differential electric field. Then we look for symmetry. This is an important step in the problem that that. Um, uh, an important conceptual thing that we have to think about. This is the trickiest conceptual part. Next, we have find the limits of integration, and then the last step, we actually perform the integral. All right? So, um, uh, this one, I don't have the solution written out in um, on the notes, so we're just going to go to one note here, and we're going to do this uh, step by step. All right, so... Um, so, this is our problem here. We have an infinitely long line of charge. And just for fun, I will draw the charges in a different color. All right. So uh, what we can do here is we can just draw our axis here. We can call this the R axis. I'm sorry. We'll call this X, Y, Z. All right. Our observation point is P out here. So let's draw that in there. And we have this infinitely long line of wire. I obviously can't draw an infinitely long wire, so I'm just drawing a portion of it. And then the charge is rho L, linear charge. Okay? So um, conceptually, what's happening here? We are going to have a bunch of electric field components, okay? So let's see, let's take, for example, let's take this charge, for example, okay? All right, so if we just look at this particular charge, the one that, that's pointed at by the blue arrow, and our observation point is P, so let, let's just call this Q just to kind of um, 
uh, relate it back to what we talked about last time in class. So that's our charge Q, and then we have this observation point P. What direction is the electric field going to be pointing? So um, let me, I guess let me restate the question here. So our observation point, we have an observation point P. All right, there's going to be an electric field at P due to this charge Q. What direction is that electric field going to point? What, what's that? It'll be, yeah, a portion of it will be in the Y plane. <coughs> but there's, there's another portion we're missing here too. The ne in the negative z direction, right? So let's remind ourselves how to do this. We, um, we say like, okay, we have that, that charge Q. And with Coulomb's law, what we did is we draw a line going from the charge Q to the point P. And that is the direction of the electric field. So this is the electric field due to Q. All right, because why? Because remember that the electric field always points away from a positive charge. All right, so the electric field lines from this positive charge are actually pointing off in all different directions like this. All right, so the, at an observation point P here, the electric field there is going to be equal to, um, equal to Q. Let me just erase those extra clutter that I put on the diagram there. All right, so our electric field Q is going to point in that direction. So the electric <laughs> field has uh, two components to it. All right. Now, what if we look at um, what if we look at this? Ah, shoot. All right, now just for kicks, I'm going to just make sure that we understand. What if we look at this point? What if we look at this point, Q2? All right, again, we draw the electric field component from there, and that electric field is going to be pointing in a slightly different direction. You all see that? So every charge on the z-axis is going to contribute some electric field at that point P. And we have to add up all those contributions in order to get the total electric field. All right. So let's just get rid of that clutter. So we're just going to say we have an arbitrary, um, we're, we're at an arbitrary distance z from the, from the z-axis. So we're going to call this, uh, here, let's go back to the blue here. We are going to be at some arbitrary point Z. And we are going to be at a fixed, fixed distance R. So we can call this, um, We'll call this R. What happened? I'm drawing that triangle so that you can see the um, the geometry of the problem here. That uh, this geometry is going to end up being very important. Okay. All right. So now let's get back to now that you kind of understand a little bit about the problem. Let's get back to our strategy. So we did step one and step two. Step three is to find a sub r, the magnitude of a sub r, which is equal to that um, capital R there, and then a sub r hat. All right. So now we're going to get right into the geometry of this. This um, distance here is um, a sub r is the vector that points from Q to P, and it's the unit vector. So the first thing that we're going to be doing, this, this is actually the vector A sub R. The vector A sub R points from Q to P. All right, so it's the leg of this triangle here. That is A sub R. So let's just label that A sub R. 
And this is a vector quantity, so I'm just going to put a little arrow above it just so you know that this is a vector quantity. All right, so the vector quantity is the arrow that connects this positive charge to the observation point P. So we can write down an equation for A sub R. So we are on step three here. So step three is to find A sub R, this capital R, and then A sub R hat. All right, so the first thing we can do is we can write down an equation for A sub R. Now, if we want to go from the point Q to the point P, what are the two, uh, how can we construct a vector to go for, um, there? What are going to be the two parts of that vector? You're going to need to travel down the z-axis, right? To get from Q to P, you're going to need to go down the z-axis and across to point P, right? So what's going to be the vector then? What's that? Exactly. That's right. So we can go, we can say negative z times z hat plus r times y hat. All right, that will get us from point P to point Q, or from point Q to point P. All right, next step is just, it's just some, some vector math. Um, r this, this thing that we call r is the distance between q and p. So it's just the magnitude of a sub r. Okay? So what is the magnitude of a sub r? What's that? Square root of z squared plus r squared. Perfect. z squared plus r squared. Okay? Now the next part here is a sub r hat. All right, and we know that to calculate unit vectors, we have to do a sub r divided by the magnitude of a sub r. And so this is just equal to negative z times z hat plus r times y hat all over z squared plus r squared. Okay, so it's like doing all the lines from the bottom line of the numbers is simply that's all to be. Oh yeah, I can do Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Um, so, but w we can generalize it this way. We can generalize it with this equation, but you know, like for the negative z values, this z is going to be negative, so then it'll fix itself. Right. So good. You're you're thinking about it. Actually, the in, there's an interesting phenomenon that happens with symmetry, which we'll we'll talk about. That step. That's one of the following steps here. Okay. So step three is uh, we, we found those three components. Uh, now the next step is to find de. All right. The way that we find de, we have this equation for it here. And we have to look at what type of problem we have. So DE, we have a line charge density in this case. So we just use this equation here. So let's write that down. So DE, conceptually what DE is, is we're finding the electric field due to this particular charge at some, at some Z. All right, so DE is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon. Um, the integral of a sub r of rho l over r squared. So the integral over the line of a sub r rho l over r squared, and dl. 
So we have to make sure that this is a vector here. So this is our, our AR AR <laughs> hat vector. I'm just gonna I'm putting an arrow above there, but you know, I think to make things less cluttered, I'm not gonna put that arrow anymore. I'll just assume that you know that AR is a vector. Okay? All right. So the next step is that uh, uh, we're going to just uh, put in some values here. So it's going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon integral from, uh, of, uh, we put in our value for a sub r. Um, so uh, a sub r hat is equal to negative z times z hat plus r times y hat. Uh, over the square root of z squared plus r squared. Now we also have um, we're, we also have we divide by uh, r squared in the denominator. So this is the square root of z squared plus r squared. So if you take this, uh, if you if you were to take a sub r and divide by uh, uh, z squared plus r squared squared, then you're going to end up with. You can confirm this. You'll end up with. Uh, Sorry. The denominator will be z squared plus r squared to the power of 3 halves. Okay. Uh, dl. You have your row l up here. Now, in this particular problem, the row l is actually, it's fixed. It's not a function of z. So you can actually take row l and put it out here, outside the integral. Um, we haven't finished our, our AR hat here yet. AR hat, the, the, the numerator for that is negative z times z hat plus r times y hat. So let's put that negative z <coughs> times z hat plus r times y hat. Okay, so everybody with me so far? Okay. All right, now this, is, this turns out it could be a pretty uh, tricky integral to do. Um, but we're going to take a step back and, and go back to the conceptual and look for symmetry because it turns out that we can actually simplify this integral uh, using symmetry. All right. And um, what was your name? Hamza. Hamza. Okay. Hamza brought up a good point that we're going we're gonna to talk about right now is that we're looking, we're going to look at the entire z axis, right? So Hamza brought up the point that um, you're, there's the positive portion of the z-axis, but there's also the negative portion of the z-axis. There's some symmetry in this problem that we can take advantage of. All right? So um, for every point z, for every point on the positive z-axis, there is another point on the negative z-axis, which is the same distance from the point p. All right, so let's just write this down. Let's assume, so by the way, we are on step five of the problem. We have to ask ourselves, is there any symmetry? And the question that we ask is, imagine that we're integrating, we're, we're adding up all the contributions of all the charges along this entire z-axis. And is there any kind of symmetry that would cause force components to cancel? The force components, I'm sorry. Is there anything that would cause electric field components to cancel. All right, so imagine that we're looking at the electric field due to this charge Q1. So we'll call this Q1. And the electric field due to Q1 looks like, looks like this. It's pointed in the lower right direction. Now, imagine that we have another, not imagine, we do have another point, Q2 here, which is at the same z distance We'll label this z as well. It's at the same z, z, z distance as q1. So it's a mirror image on the, uh, uh, you know, along the y-axis. And we also draw our, the electric field component due to q2. All right? So we have eq1 and eq2. What's going to happen when you take the sum total of those? The z hat comes out to be zero. Exactly. So that's a super important point here. That's a piece of symmetry that we can take advantage of. 
when when eq1 and eq2 add up the z, the z components disappear and the total electric field looks something like this it only has it only has a y component to it or r hat component depending on whatever um, you know we're we're actually actually we're using since we put y hat in here we're actually using the cartesian system okay they're they're both equivalent equivalent so the important part of the symmetry about this problem is that we noticed, and this is where the intuition comes really important, you have to be able to intuitively draw and look at these problems, is we realize that for every single point on the z-axis, there's going to be another point on the negative z-axis and um, that's going to contribute a, a, an equal and opposite electric field in the z-dimension. So as a result, the, the total electric field in the z-axis in the z-direction is basically going to be zero because for every single point on this on the positive z-axis there's also a point on the negative z-axis which is going to cancel uh, in some ways cancel that uh, part of that uh, field out so the important simplification here is that we know that all the all the z components of the electric field are going to be thrown out later due to symmetry. So we can actually cross this out right now. Okay? <coughs> now I should tell you, if we actually went through the math and we solved the, um, if we did the integral for all values of z, and uh, we would just have to do a lot more math, but we would actually find that, that the answer that we get is, is the same. Okay? But this thing that we're doing here saves us a lot of time. Because we only have to we have to only have to integrate this y component here. We don't have to worry about this extra component here. Okay, Is everyone with me with that? Great. So in step five, our step five was essentially looking at symmetry due to symmetry. Uh, Z component is zero. Z component of the electric field is zero. So we're just getting rid of that now. All right. So this is all the engineering portion of it, or the analytical portion of it. The rest of it is more mathematical. Well, let's see, one more little thing here. Limits of integration. This is also pretty straightforward. So, um, where are we going to be integrating our charge? Where does our charge reside? Negative infinity. From negative infinity to infinity. Great. So, Z equals from negative infinity to infinity. Okay? And just, just for completeness sake, what, what value of y are we at? What value of r are we at? We're at the, we're at the z-axis, so what is r equal to there? Zero. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, since we're doing this in the Cartesian system, we can also say y equals zero. Right, so whenever we do this limits of integration thing, we want, we're just looking specifically at what are we integrating. We know this is a one-dimensional integration, so one variable is going to have a range, and all the other variables are going to be fixed. Right? If we had a two-dimensional, if we had to integrate over a two-dimensional surface, then we would actually have a range on two, uh, two uh, variables, two coordinates, and then one of, the, one of the coordinates would be fixed. All right. So the last step is to perform the integral. So the electric field is equal to the integral of dE. Oh gosh, let me fix something here. We actually, yeah, this is this is actually the electric field. We set up the integral here.
the DE is just whatever is in, inside um, 1 over 4 pi epsilon a sub r hat times rho L over r squared. You know, that's just a restatement of, yeah. it's just a restatement of what we have. <coughs> yeah, I didn't bother writing that down. So I went immediately to the electric field equation, so with, with the integral. So let me just um, let me just write this down. It's the it's the integral of dE, and so um, as we found here, uh, the z component is gone. So the electric field is equal to rho sub l over four pi epsilon integral of r times y hat over z squared plus r squared. Now, we have to make sure that we put in our limits of integration properly. So, um, oh, this is to the 3 halves. Okay, we are integrating from, from what is our range of z? Negative infinity to infinity. Negative infinity to infinity. All right. And out here, our dl... If we just make a little note here, dl is in this coordinate system is just equal to dz. All right, so this is the integral that we have to, uh, this is the integral that we have to solve. All right, so <coughs> I'm guessing you may not know how to do this particular integral because I didn't know off the top of my head. Um, I actually had to look it up on an integral table. And the integral, so I reached for the integral table that I gave you in the, in the exam. And that's a pretty, pretty good one. It has a lot of them on there. So number 41 on this integral table actually gives you this. So um, I'm just going to put a little note here. Integral table. This was number 41. And this states that the integral of dx over a squared plus x squared to the power of 3 halves is equal to x over a squared, square root of a squared plus x squared. All right, so this is just a general form for a function a function x and a is some is some constant and x is your variable of integration so if you look at the function that we have here it's actually in that form because you have our variable of integration is z so we have our z here and we also have a constant here so this is a squared plus x squared and this is you know our x squared plus a squared you know it's just flipped and it's and it's to the power of 3 halves so this is exactly the form, so we can just use that, um, use that integral table to, to do the integration here. So we're left with, um, just put down the rho L over 4 pi epsilon here. Um, the y hat can actually can bring that out. Okay, that's just a direction vector. And we can also bring out the r. Okay. Keep in mind, like just what you're, you know, we often deal with a lot of vector uh, variables. So you have to think about what variables can, uh, what variables are constant. In this integral, we are integrating with respect to z. Okay, so this r is just is just a constant. It's not being integrated, so that can come out of the equation. The y hat can also come out of the uh, integral equation. All right, so what's left is just the 1 over you know, the dz over z squared plus r squared, and that's what this form that you have here on the left is. And so the integral here is going to be, um, it's going to be z over r squared, the square root of r squared plus z squared, and that is evaluated from negative infinity to infinity. All right, so 
rho sub L times R times Y hat over four pi epsilon. So we're gonna first substitute in positive infinity. So we do infinity over R squared <coughs> square root of R squared plus infinity minus negative infinity R squared Okay. Now I know in some of your math classes, um, you know, your math professors would, would frown on something like this, like substituting in infinity and negative infinity. You know, the proper way to do that, they'd say they, they would want to show like the limit as z goes to infinity of this function, blah, 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 blah. I'm lazy, so I like to actually just write in the infinity myself and then just think about what the limits are in my own head. So this is an engineering class, not a math class, so we can, we can get away with that. All right. Okay, so um, what happens when you take infinity plus some something that's non-infinite? What does this, what, what does this uh, uh, become? Just, just the square root portion here. In, it becomes infinity squared, and you take the square root of that. This r squared becomes insignificant compared to infinity squared, right? So this becomes infinity over r squared times <coughs> the square root of infinity squared, which is just infinity. Okay, so these two cancel. And you're left with 1 over r squared there. And same thing happens here you end up with negative 1 over r squared. Actually, you could have taken the r squared out uh, before. So this ends up r y hat 4 pi epsilon 1 over r squared. And this is just 1 minus negative 1, so which is 2. This r and this squared cancel, so you're left with on this 2, you're left with 2 here. So you're left with rho l over 2 pi epsilon r, and the field is in the y hat direction. Okay, so this is your electric field. Would you only be able to do this if the charge density is constant and it wasn't a functional thing? Um, well, in this particular problem, the charge density is constant. So if the charge density is constant, it allows you to take the rho L outside of the integral. Okay, And because of the symmetry, because the charge density is equal and opposite on the positive and negative z-axis, we, we were able to tell ourselves that, hey, there's going to be no z-component to the electric field. So if you did not have, um, if you had a non-constant charge uh, density, then you'd have to look at whether it's symmetric still on the on the positive and negative z-axis. It may still be it may still be symmetric, but just not constant, right? Um, and also, you could not take the rho l out of the integral. You'd have to evaluate it inside the integral. All right. So you could see that there were a lot of steps to this problem. And we're going to show you another way to do this problem later where, um, where you use Gauss's law and it, and it simplifies a little bit. All right. So uh, questions. Does anyone need a little bit of extra time to write, write this stuff down? OK. I mean, you can always like look look at the um, you know you can always look at the uh, the YouTube recordings later. 
So let's quickly review the steps that we did. Okay. The first thing we did, we saw, we saw this problem, we said, okay, it's a line chart, so it's an easy question. It's going to be a one-dimensional integration. Uh, we use the Cartesian coordinate system, cylindrical coordinate system, both are really the same here. The next thing we do is we found, we found the, the vector. We found the vector connecting one of the charges to the observation point P, and we labeled that A sub R. We found, um, we found that vector a sub r, we found the magnitude of that vector, and then we found the unit vector. So that was just, you know, pretty much easy vector algebra. Uh, part four is we wrote down that equation for the differential electric field, and we actually wrote down the, the integrated equation as well. That step five, we looked at symmetry. We said that the z component of the fields are gonna cancel. And because of that, that simplifies our integration quite a bit. We say there's no z hat component to the electric field so that we don't have to do as much integral work. We found the limits of integration. z equals negative infinity to infinity. And we're at r equals zero, y equals zero we're at, because we're at the z axis. Um, and then finally, we, we perform the integral using the, this integral table. All right. And we had, when we plugged in our limits of integration, we had to keep in mind that we're actually putting in infinities and negative infinities, so we have to think about limits when we're actually doing that calculation. <clears throat> okay, uh, we're going to do a second problem here, which is just incrementally more uh, complex, but it's still a linear charge density. And in your homeworks, you're gonna actually going to have one where you do a surface integral. So it's going to be one step up from this. And you have to think about how to how to do that. So I'm going to leave that one as a homework problem, but we're going to be doing this other example of uh, an electric field from a ring of charge. Same strategy. We have to first ask ourselves it's a, whether it's a volume surface or line integral, and then all the other steps. But let, let's see what we have here. So in this example, we had a line of charge, infinite line of charge, and here we have a ring of charge. So imagine that you have like a washer type thing here and there's a charge density on that washer. And think about as think about it as like a small line of charge in a, that's arranged in a circle. And your observation point P is up here it's on the z axis. Now the fact that it's on the z axis means you're going to have some kind of symmetry. And we'll go over that. So um if it's not on the z-axis, well, then it becomes a, uh, a harder problem to solve by hand. Um, and, you know, you may be better off just using um, like a simulation tool. All right. So um, we're going to be doing this problem step by step. We have an observation point P at some distance, um, some point on the z-axis, at some height above the z-axis, some height H. The ring of charge has a radius B. All right, and you're asked to find the electric field intensity on the z-axis. So, um, uh, with this one, I actually have, have the solution written down here, but we'll, we'll go through this uh, step by step. In fact, I might just like write, write out portions of it so that you can see. Um, so I'll just go back here and just a ask the first two questions, which is straightforward. Um, is this going to be a volume, surface, or line integration? Line integration. Why? Because we have a row L, a line of charge. So we're going to be doing a single dimension integral. Um, jumping ahead for a second here, what are going to be the limits of integration? It's going to go from phi is equal to 0 to 2 pi. That's correct, because we are integrating along this ring of charge. And what is going to be our value for z? Zero. z equals 0. That's right. Um, and our phi is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. Good. And what's going to be our radius? B. B. It's fixed radius. OK. So you all, you all answered the second question here as well. Now, what coordinate system are we in? For a ring of charge like this, it's, it makes sense to use a cylindrical coordinate system. Okay, so we're just thinking very methodically about like how our integration is going to work in this problem. 
integrating right over, we're going to be integrating around the charge, so our phi is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. We're at a fixed radius b, and we're at z equals 0. So we're doing a little bit of work ahead of ourselves. So this is, again, a 1D integration. The coordinate system is definitely cylindrical in this case. And then our, we're on to the next step, finding a sub r, r, and a sub r hat. So actually, I think the, the best thing to do is to probably just show it right on this diagram because, um, you know, this diagram is already nicely drawn for us. <coughs> at our observation point P up here, we're at a point that's a certain height above the x-axis. Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to look we're going to look at the contribution of every single charge, every single red cross that you see here um, along this ring. So let's imagine that there is, you know, there's a charge here at this point. Okay, and this is where um, this is where our Q is. So our charge is located at some point along that ring, and then our observation point P is up here. Now, um, I'm just going to cross this guy out because the book uses a slightly different notation. So the notation that we're going to use is the A sub R. Right, this is a vector. This vector connects the point Q down here to the observation point P, where the charge is located to where P is located. So what's, uh, what's the equation for A sub R? If we want to go from Q to P, how do we get there? Uh, oh, well, you, you're already, um, you're going one step ahead and you're thinking about what the actual distance is. But I'm saying, like, what is the vector what is the vector that gets us from Q to P? Minus B R hat plus H C R. Minus B times R hat plus H times Z hat. Okay. So we're at this point Q. We're going to go towards the center. We're going to go towards the center, so we're going in the negative r hat direction. That's why you see a negative here. We're at a radius b. This radius of uh, ring of charge has a radius b. So we're going to go in for a distance of b so that we get to the z-axis. And then from there, we're going to go up a distance h. So that's how we got our a sub, um, a, a sub r. You know, the other way you can do this is a sub r... You can just do um, p um, p minus q. I'm sorry. You can do q minus p. My bad. Q minus p. So um, q. Uh, what are the coordinates for q? So this point q. What are the what are the coordinates for that in cylindrical coordinates? Yeah, B, phi, some arbitrary point phi, zero. Okay, so that's the point Q. We're going to subtract the point P. Where is P located? Zero, zero, H. Right. Okay. And um, so if you subtract the R components, you get um, B, and this is in the R hat direction, and then you get phi in the phi hat direction. But that phi, you know, you're going to be, the, the point P is actually at zero. You know, it, it's along the z-axis, so it could be at any phi uh, direction. 
and then you're at negative h times z hat. So these, um, the z components you subtract out, and uh, you end up with uh, um, the, these components. I, I'm sorry, I think I actually wrote this wrong. It should be p minus q. I always mix those up. It should be p minus q. So this would be a negative here, positive here. Sorry about that. And as I said, you could ignore the phi because there's no value for phi in the z-axis, right? When you're on the z-axis, the, the phi is meaningless. So that's why you can say that this is negative b times r hat plus h times z hat. All right, which is really the same thing that you did here. I prefer doing it this way. I think it's more intuitive than doing it the, the mathematical way. All right, in any case, we have defined now, we've defined a sub r. Any questions on that? All right. Now, so we've done this. Now we want to find r. How do we find r? r is just the distance between them. The magnitude of a sub r. Okay, if this is a sub r, negative b times r hat plus h times z hat, what is going to be the magnitude of that vector? Oh, you, you're already thinking ahead to what the unit vector is. I'm just talking about what is the distance. The distance from point Q to point P. B squared uh, plus H squared. Yeah, square root. square root of B squared plus H squared. Okay. And A sub R hat is going to be equal to negative B r hat plus hc hat over the magnitude, which we just figured out, b squared plus h squared. Okay. All right, so that's, that's the same thing that's over here. Okay, we found a sub r, we found the magnitude of a sub r, and then we found the unit vector a sub r in this direction. Okay, the next step is just to find dE. Okay, we have an equation for dE, so we just roll with that. DE is equal to the magnitude of, uh, you know, the a sub r, a sub r hat, same as this. This is a small r, this is a capital R, so please excuse that if you're, you know, any confusion in the notation. These, these are two that are the same vector. Um, and then uh, you have your rho over 4 pi epsilon r squared. So in the case of a, uh, a linear charge distribution, this rho becomes rho sub l. Is 4 pi epsilon still there? This r squared, we already calculated r, so we just put in our b squared plus h squared. Okay, square root of b squared plus h squared is, is equal to r. But then we also have to multiply that by a sub r over r hat. So let's just, let me just write that down so we all are, you know, we're all good on that. Rho sub l, 4 pi epsilon. So our a sub r is negative b r hat plus h z hat over square root of b squared plus h squared. And this is then multiplied by 1 over r squared. So this is 1 over. So this is r. It's the square root of b squared plus h squared. You square that, and you get b squared plus 
h squared. Okay, so I'm just showing you the intermediate step here. You substitute an a sub r, you substitute an r, you get this. And then um, you simplify this b squared plus h squared in the denominator. So this is b squared plus h squared to the 1 half, to the power of 1 half. This is b squared plus h squared to the power of 1. So you add the two, you get three halves in the denominator here. And your, deno uh, your numerator is as shown. OK, you all, all with me so far? Good. All right, now the big question. Symmetry. All right, you're already seeing this here. So maybe it's better to ask why. So step five is you look to see if there's any symmetry in the problem that can cause some of these field components to cancel out. So you notice that you have a field component in the r hat direction and you have a field component in the z hat direction. So the question here is, will either of those terms uh, cancel out due to symmetry? If not, then you, of course, have to do the integral. So we check for that here. So the, the answer to number five is yes. The r hat term disappears due to symmetry. So the question I'm going to pose to you then is why? So I want you all to like think about this for a second and think about why. So I'm just going to go back to the... Um, go back to this pro um, picture here. Um, since we're already done with this, I'm just going to erase the ink on this slide so that it's clear. So take a look at the symmetry. I'll give you a minute to think about it. Think about if there's going to be any symmetry. Why would that symmetry cause the r hat terms to cancel? In the previous problem, the z hat terms canceled out. In this one, the r hat term cancels out. So. You know, draw on your notebooks if you have to. And think about where the symmetry comes from. I'll give you uh, I'll give you a minute to think about it, and then we can continue. Okay. Since R is rotating with respect to T5, on the right hand plane it's gonna be positive, and the left hand plane it's gonna be negative. So the right hand the right hand plane meaning in the positive y, y direction? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the left hand plane, which is the negative R direction, they're gonna cancel out. Exactly. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Nice. So I'm going to show this. I'm going to show this here in this diagram. So for every for every point that we have on one side of the circle. So let's say we're at some some point phi here. Okay. So the electric field component from one de one is pointing in this direction. Okay. How do we find de? How do we know the direction of de one? We take we take the Q, where the charge is, and we look at the observation point P. We drew our vector. Again, this is, this is our A sub R vector. We drew a line from here. 
And we just continue that line on this way to find DE1. <coughs> and we do the same thing for a charge that's located right across, across the circle. So this point 2 here, and then this DE2 points in this direction. Okay. Now if you can see the symmetry here, you'll notice that DE2, DE1 and DE2, they have the same R components. They're, um, they're mirror images of each other across the z-axis. So they have the same R components. And this is explicitly shown in the drawing here, where it says DE1, uh, DE1 and the radial component of that, the R component, and then DE2, the R component of that, they're equal to each other. That's the key symmet symmetry part. That's a key trick to solving this problem. Okay. So, um, you then have, um, you can assume that the radial components, for every point that you, for every point of charge that you have on one side of the axis, there's going to be a point on the opposite side, on the, on the opposite side of the circle that's going to end up canceling out the R component of the field. So, for that reason, we can actually cross this guy out, and that simplifies our calculation significantly. All right, okay, so from there, um, now uh, we found that there's symmetry, you simplify that. We already found the limits of integration, okay, if we were integrating, we're trying to include the contributions of every charge along this ring, so we have to integrate along this ring. So our five variable is going to go all the way around the, around the circle, so zero to two pi, phi, we're at a fixed radius, b, so that's why our r is equal to b, we're going around like this. All right, it's a single integral, so it's only one, uh, one variable of integration. And then I'm just going to, um, I'm not going to bother copying this part down again, but I want to point out the, the important parts here, okay? Um, so the total electric field is the integral of DE. And uh, notice here, this is an important part of this problem which is not present in the Cartesian problem. Our five variable is going from 0 to 2 pi, and because of that, instead of, um, you know, our, my, my integration, uh, integration variable, on this side I have to have R D phi. Not just D phi, it has to be R times D phi. Okay, so when you set up your integrals, don't forget, that's the reason why we look at the limits of integration separately. We said, okay, we're going to integrate with respect to phi, so I need to, my differential length element is going to be r times d phi. Okay, so the next step, you substitute in the formula for dE that you found earlier up here, and we did find that the r hat component cancels, so we just put in just the z hat component here. Right? And um, this r times d phi, since we're at a fixed radius, we're at a fixed radius, so then that radius becomes b. Okay, we have b squared plus h squared here. Um, now in this case, the form of the uh, integration that we have Notice what we have here. This is slightly different from the previous problem, so the math is actually easier. Let's look at all these vari variables. Um, does rho L, does that vary as a function of phi? In this problem. It's a constant. It, does, it doesn't vary as a function of phi, so that goes outside of the integral. 4 pi epsilon goes outside of the integral. And the interesting thing is here is none of this also, none of this is a function of phi. The height is not a function of phi. The radius is not a function of phi. None of this is a function of phi. So everything here, everything here goes outside of the integral. The only thing that's left in the integral is, <coughs> is d phi. 
And so the integral of d5 from 0 to 2 pi is trivial. It's, it's equal to 2 pi. And then so you got 2 pi here, and then you have this here, and you end up, uh, you know, the, the, the 2 and the 2 pi cancels with the 4 pi here, and you're left with rho L times BH over 2 epsilon B squared plus H squared to the 3 halves of the denominator. And this is all in the Z hat direction. So the field, the total sum electric field that you get at this point is just in the Z direction. There's no R component to it. Okay, this only applies if you're right on the Z axis. If you're not on the Z axis, you don't have the symmetry anymore, right? Then you have to do the full math problem, include the R hat component and the Z hat component. All right, and then it becomes an ugly math problem, and that's why it's not an example. A lot of the examples that you do in textbooks are all like nice and neat, you know, they, they give you a nice little, nice equation at the end. In the real world, when you're trying to find electric field distributions and things like that, you often use some kind of simulation tool, like POMSOL, which is what we're going to be, uh, we'll be doing that after, um, after break. So over break, I might just post, um, I, I might post like a tutorial on just how to do the electrostatic simulation. So if you have time, if you're in town, and you want to get a head start on that, you're, you're more than welcome is, to is do that. Is a free program, or is it just... Uh, the question is, is a COMSOL a free program? No, a COMSOL is, uh, the Wayne State has a license for that. We purchased that, and it's, it's, it's actually a pretty expensive software. <laughs> I see you're smiling over there. Have you used it before? No, oh, okay. but I just don't want to spend the money. <laughs> Did you call them up and ever get a quote? No. It's, it's not like MATLAB. You know, MATLAB, the student version will run you, what, like 100 bucks? Which also is, I think, is kind of a, a lot of money, considering like you can do all this stuff in Python for free nowadays. Right. Comsol will cost you maybe a thousand to two thousand. So yeah, it's not a it's not a software that you you want to buy yourself unless you're really wealthy and you just really want it. <laughs> but um, no, Comsol you'll be using in the labs. And you know how we have this VDI thing, the VLAB thing, the VLAB thing where you can access it in, in your computer. Unfortunately, our our license does not allow us to do that. We have fixed seats, which means you actually have to go to the computer lab to do that. So I apologize for that, but you know, I think they should change over their licensing mechanisms because who actually goes to a computer lab nowadays, you know? <laughs> In any case, um, so yeah, our, um, you have to actually go physically <laughs> to the computer lab and log onto the machines there and you can use, um, uh, you can use console there, right? And wh what you'll find, console is like a nice modeling tool that allows you to just find find electric fields, you, you draw out where the charges are and it'll give you the electric fields, okay? So we have like 15 minutes left, so we, we have to cover Gauss's law today too. Unfortunately, this, this stuff goes a little bit faster, but you have to think about it very uh, cleverly. So context again, what, what we're doing in class today is we are trying to find electric fields due to a charge distribution. And I just showed you two example problems where we did it what's called the brute force method, okay? We'd use the brute force method to find the electric field. And it takes seven, seven steps the way I've defined it. Like it takes, it, it's a lot of work. You have to think about it. Um, it. You will have problems like that on your test. So know how to do those kinds of problems. Um, but if you, it, in certain types of problems where you have symmetry, where you have um, even more symmetry than the ones that we've looked at already, you can apply Gauss's law. Gauss's law will greatly simplify the problem and you'll be able to figure out the electric fields just from, you know, almost by inspection. Um, so, but let, let, let's get into what Gauss's law is. Um, Gauss's law is really just the first, um, uh, the, the first Maxwell equation. Okay, uh, the first Maxwell equation is um, del dot d is equal to rho v. Okay, but we also know that um, d is equal to epsilon um, e. All right, so e um, e is going to be equal to d over epsilon. Okay, so uh, if we divide, um, <coughs> if we divide d, if we divide both sides of this equation, 
uh, by epsilon. So this is divide this by epsilon, divide this by epsilon. Then we get the electric field on the left side, and we get rho v over epsilon on the right side. So this is just a restatement of the first Maxwell equation. Okay? And so it's called Gauss's law. And Gauss's law basically states, does anyone remember? What's the English, uh, what's the English translation of this equation of Gauss's law? Divergence of the divergence of the electric field is equal to charge. So what 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 do you visualize when you think about that? Divergence of electric field is equal to the charge outward density. Flux. Yeah, you think about net outward flux. That's right. So divergence of the electric field means how much the electric field is diverging. How much the there's outward flux from a given point. The amount of outward flux from a given point is equal to the charge density at that point. The more charge you have, the more outward flux there's going to be. And if you have a negative charge density, then you have a negative, you have an inward flux. Okay? So, um, when you integrate this over a volume, there's different forms of Gauss's law. There's the differential form and then there's the integral form. The differential form is shown here, and this is a Maxwell equation. If you take the integral of both sides of the equation, then you get the integral form. So you get integral form 1, integral form 2, and so um, integral form 1, you take the, the, the volume, uh, um, you, take the, you take a volume integral on both sides, so you take the triple integral on this side, and you also take the triple integral on this side. Now, the triple integral of a charge density is equal to the total charge. So that's why on the right-hand side, you see you get Q over epsilon on the right side. And on the left side, you're left with the triple integral of the volume uh, with respect to um, of the divergence of the field. Another integral <laughs> form of this is where you apply the divergence theorem. Okay, so if you recall the divergence theorem, we don't have time to go over it again. But like this volume integral of the divergence can be converted into a surface integral of a closed contour, and that's you know you can go back and look at the lecture slides from. <coughs> when we talked about uh, uh, the divergence theorem. So both of these uh, two integral forms are equivalent. And Gauss's law takes advantage of this one. Okay? <coughs> if we use integral form too cleverly, we can simplify a lot of the electrostatics problems. So a key to applying this is to define what we call a Gaussian surface. So this integral form, it has a closed surface. Note that this is a closed surface. All right, so what is this saying? This is saying that if we have some kind of closed surface, S, so closed surface means that that surface is enclosing a volume, OK? The, the, the surface integral of e dot ds is equal to q over epsilon. So q represents the total charge inside the volume. So if there are a bunch of charges inside a volume enclosed by the surface s, that total charge is equal to q. All right? And uh, so this is the right side of the equation. The left side of the equation is e dot ds, uh, the double integral of that. Uh, is uh, is equal to Q over epsilon here. So ds is the, um, you know, going back to surface integrals, uh, ds is the unit vector that points outside, out, out of the surface. All right. So the key to applying Gauss's laws to define a Gaussian surface, we have to select a surface so that the electric field is perpendicular everywhere um, on the surface. And the magnitude of the electric field should also be the same on the surface everywhere. The best way to, to, you know, the best way to do this, of course, is just to do an example problem, okay? So what we're going to do is we're actually going to take the same infinite wire problem that we solved earlier using the brute force approach, and we're going to solve the same one using Gauss's law, and I'm going to show you how much easier it is to solve the problem in that case. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to actually do the solution right on here because there's not all that much math required once you recognize the, the beauty of using Gauss's law. All right, so you still have rho L, an infinite line of charge. The trick here is that you have to think intuitively about this. So 
if, if you want to try to apply Gauss's law to a problem, you have to think about, okay, can I define a Gaussian surface? In that Gaussian surface, the electric field has to be perpendicular everywhere on the surface, and the magnitude of the electric field should be the same everywhere on the surface. Okay, and um, so in this particular problem, what kind of surface could you draw where the electric field would be the same everywhere on the surface? A cylinder. A cylinder, that's right. So let me just, you know, I, I'm going to draw something stupid here. Just so, you know, just so we can kind of start thinking about this. Let's say I was, let's say my Gaussian surface was like a, a, a rectangle like this. And the question I want to ask myself is, is the, um, uh, is the electric field going to be same everywhere on that surface? So is the electric field going to be the same here as it is here? So if I were to draw this surface here, so these two points here, are these two points going to have the same electric field? They're the same distance away from the, from the cylinder. Yeah. They will. We found in the last problem that like, you know, that, that the, that the um, electric field is basically proportional to how far away you are from the line of wire. But this is where you have to build up an intuition. You, even without solving the problem, you got to kind of know that, hey, you know, like, both of these points, they're the same distance away from the wire, so they should have the same electric field. Um, but what if, I was at, what if I was at this point out here? What if I was on the corner? It's not going to have the same electric field because it's a different distance. Right? So I just gave that, that silly example so that you can kind of get an idea of what is not an appropriate Gaussian surface to use. So an appropriate Gaussian surface to use in this problem is a cylinder. Okay, and more specifically, it is the, this portion of the cylinder, the outside portion of the cylinder, not the top or the bottom. So I'm just going to delete that to keep this clear. Just the outside portion of the cylinder. Why is that? Let's look, let's look carefully at this. <laughs> so at some point, at some point on the surface of the cylinder, you imagine this is your observation point P on the surface of the cylinder. The electric field is going to point out in this direction. You know, we know that some distance away from the wire that um, our electric field is just going to have a radial component. We kind of know that from the last problem that we solved, or when we, when we solved the full problem. But, but I'm hoping that now you should actually be able to know that without even doing any mathematics, you should be able to know that, that the electric field is just going to have a radial component. It's not going to have a Z component. So that's the first thing. That satisfies the first criteria. The first criteria that the electric field is perpendicular everywhere on the surface. The second criteria is the magnitude of the electric field is, is the same everywhere on the surface. So at this point on the surface, you're at a distance r, so, so you're, you have some kind of electric field. At, at, this point, at this point on the surface, as long as you're at some distance r away from the line, you're, the magnitude of your field is all going to be the same. So that's why this, the outside portion of the cylinder is your Gaussian surface. Okay. So the next, um, the next step is to... Um, is to then use Gauss's law. So we're just going to put that here. Um, so is it like integral of e dot ds is equal to q over epsilon. Okay, and this is our surface. Okay. So what we're doing now is we are going to solve for the radial component of the electric field on the surface. This is where symmetry comes in. Okay, so we're going to be doing, um, we're going to be simplifying this, saying E is only going to have a radial component. Does everyone see this? At every point on the surface, this is an infinitely long wire. There's going to be no Z component. There's going to be no phi component to the field. There's only a radial component to the field. 
All right, so there's a radial component to the field. Um, at, when we're on the surface here, so we are on this on this outer this outer surface here. Which way is the ds vector going to point? So we're talking about this guy here. It's going to point in the radial direction. ds is going to be equal to r hat. It's going to point in the r hat direction. And does anyone just recall real quick what what the two points are going to be? What are we going to add to this? What is our ds equal to? It's r hat times. I'll just give it to you, r d phi d z, okay? So our, our, um, our electric field only has a radial component, so it's in the r hat direction. Our d s is um, r hat, is also points in the r hat direction. So we're left with, uh, when we uh, take the dot product of the two, we're left with e sub r, <coughs> r d phi, dz, and you're going to take the integral of this over the entire surface of the cylinder here. And our, from the, you know, we've done these types of surface integrals before, so that's why I'm going over them quickly. So we're going to be integrating from phi equals 0 to 2 pi, and z, our z is actually going to go from 0 to l. Okay, this is the important part here. We are going to say, a part of using Gauss's laws, we're going to say, we're going to integrate over some distance L. And we're going to see that that's going to cancel. Um, okay, so again, in the interest of time here, um, if you do this math here, you'll see very easily that this comes out to... Um, 2 pi r times l times e sub r is equal to q epsilon. Actually, the, the right side of the equation we're going to do now. The q over epsilon, now this is a, another little trick about using Gauss's law. The total charge, if we look at the total charge contained in this volume, Gauss's law states that the surface integral of the electric field uh, on the surface of the volume is equal to, to equal to the total charge contained in the volume. So the total charge contained in the volume, Q, is going to be rho L times L. Okay, That's the reason that we actually use this L to begin with. The total charge contained in this cylinder is rho L times L. So coulombs per meter times meters, you get to coulombs as a total. And so this is going to be rho L times L over epsilon, rho L times L over epsilon, okay? And then you can just solve for the radial electric field, because these L's cancel, and you're left with rho L over 2 pi r epsilon okay and you'll you'll actually can confirm that <coughs> you can actually confirm that this the same uh, this is the same result that we got from doing it using the brute force approach except we just we just did it in just a few lines okay all right so um, this is a good stopping point. Actually, one more thing. Looking at this ring problem, I just want you to see that, okay, we solved the infinite wire problem. You're thinking, well, we could probably solve the, 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 the ring problem too. Uh, you can think about this on your own. Can we use Gauss's law in the ring problem? So the question you have to ask yourself is, can you define a Gaussian surface such that the electric field is perpendicular everywhere on the surface and it's equal everywhere on that surface. So with the ring of charge, could you define some kind of closed surface so that the electric field is exactly the same everywhere? Do you have to use a sphere? 
Um, a sphere wouldn't work. A sphere wouldn't work because you know you have this ring of charge. So there's some non-uniformity there, and in, in the surface of the sphere, it wouldn't wouldn't be symmetric everywhere. But it's a good guess. The closest one would actually be a donut. But I will tell you that even on the surface of the donut, um, the, the, field, the fields would not be the same magnitude everywhere. On the donut, it's true that the direction would be perpendicular to the surface, but it would not be the same magnitude everywhere. So the answer here is you, you actually there is no surface. <laughs> oh, you had another suggestion? I was just going to say take a line and make a circle on a line and then use a Cartesian uh, equation to represent. A a, like a torus. You're talking about the donut, it seems like. Um, kind of. So the geometry you're talking about is slightly different. Okay. Yeah. Basically, it's a donut, but that's super, super thin, so much so that you just call it a line. Oh, I see, I see. It's basically a circle. That's ah, okay, okay. That's you're talking about the donut with like a very, very small internal radius. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's getting really close. But the, but the problem that you would have is that the, the field lines on the inside would be stronger than the field lines on the outside. So the magnitude wouldn't actually be the same everywhere. So as a reason, if, if you look at what we did here, the reason why this simplified so easily is because the electric field was the same everywhere on the surface. The E sub R here, the E sub R was a constant so that it just came right out of the integral. You didn't have to do any integration on that. So that's the key to simplifying Gauss's law. So the answer here is that there's no Gaussian surface that has that meets the criteria. There's no surface that meets the criteria for a Gaussian surface. So you can't apply Gauss's law to this problem. So I want you all to do this last one at home. This is actually um, this is in spherical coordinates. What you can do is actually derive Coulomb's law. You can derive the electric field from a single point source by using Gauss's law. Okay, do that problem on your own as a homework as a homework problem. I might just even throw it in in the homework, and um, you'll see that you'll get uh, you'll get the electric field from a single point source. Okay, all right, good good stopping point. Next time we'll talk about potential electrostatic potential energy. So everyone have a good um, have a good spring break. I expect to get the exams back to you on Monday uh, after spring break. I may even have the grades posted uh, before spring break, but you won't actually see your exam until afterwards. Can we have our uh, cheat sheets back too, if it's possible? Yeah, I can get okay. I can get those back too. Sure. Awesome. <laughs>